Welcome, I am Nick Stellino. Today we have a couple of wonderful recipes for you. As a matter of fact, we will make shrimp, garbanzo, arugula, and sun-dried tomatoes in a chardonnay sauce. And then, oh, it's not finished, then we're gonna do roasted shrimp with watermelon and goat cheese salad. Please, join me in the kitchen. Debra, I will take a pound of the shrimp that you showed. I'll get that for you, Nick. Thank you, appreciate yeah. it. Shrimp, I love shrimp. Shrimp is mysterious. As a matter of fact, more often than not, people make a mistake between shrimp and prawn. They're not the same thing, they're completely different. Uh, the reason why sometimes shrimps are called prawns is because the uh, colossal shrimp, I love that name, Col who came up with it? Must have been a great marketer. Colossal shrimp is referred to any type of shrimp that's large enough there's only about you know 10 to 11 of them maximum in a count of a pound. Colossal shrimp sometimes is referred to as a prawn, but they are not prawns, they are colossal shrimp. Thinking about this, there is colossal shrimp, there is jumbo shrimp, there is extra large shrimp, there is large shrimp, and so forth and so on. Grazie Bella. Now, depending on the recipes that you make, you have to choose the shrimp that you want. For the grilling myself, I like to go either with colossal or jumbo because they respond to the heat a lot, lot better, and they're full of juices. And also keep this in mind, there's a difference between shrimps that are grown in cold waters and shrimps that are grown in uh, uh, warm water. The cold water shrimp is much, much smaller because they have to resist an incredible coldness of the water, but they are juicier because of the little bit of extra fat that they have in responding to the change of temperature. Uh, warm water shrimp tend to be bigger and a little bit more leaner. And remember, shrimp is something that you need to cook with care because it goes from cooked to overcooked quite quickly. I have in mind an idea of something special I want to make for you. I'm going to show you to use these extra large shrimps and put them together into a recipe that will become from now on one of your favorite ones. So come with me to the kitchen, I'll show you how. Shrimp with garbanzo beans, arugula and sun-dried tomatoes. What a saute this is, it's wonderful. By the way, not only that, it will make a Chardonnay sauce. You will love the way in which we make this because it's completely full of flavor and a different way to approach it. Something that involves, ah, 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 I'm not telling you the secret. You're gonna have to watch. You ready? Let's go at it. Now, usual situation, we want to start out and build the sauce element by element, bringing it to where ultimately will give us the greatest yield of flavor. The beginning always remains fairly simple. It remains the same. And you have to remember that when we discuss onions, celery, uh, and, uh, and carrots, they are present in just about every sauce making technique that exists. This in Italian is called il soffritto, also known as il triumvirato. The meaning of triumvirato means the three famous ones. As Italians, we get to over romanticize everything. But in no matter what type of sauce you make, these flavors bring in the, how can I say, the, the, the established building block upon which all of the various layers are built upon. How you treat them is extremely important. I see many times that people start out the pan with very hot heat. Very hot heat tends to scorch the veggies. And in my opinion, if you darken them in, at the very beginning of the sauce, you turn the sauce to a side which I don't find to be as appealing as it should be. The reason why I always start this on very low heat and bring it to temperature as we go about is because I want a three to four minutes of individual heating in the pan with these ingredients to get for us what we want to have. Once these basically get to a nice softened state and will be in three or four minutes, then you start adding the other ingredients. What are the other ingredients that you want to add? Red pepper flakes. The reason why I love red pepper flakes, first and foremost, is because uh, they allow you to control the heat of what it is that you want to do. But there is one ingredient that you have to see that is fantastic. Pancetta. What is pancetta? Pancetta is uh, first and foremost pork belly. As Italians use this pork belly as one of the building blocks of everything that we make, mostly used for pasta sauces. Uh, but I find that uh, the mixing of pork meat with shrimp as a dynamic where almost the yin and yang of things that come in together. Pancetta, when you go to the store, basically looks like something like this. Basically this, as you can see it, is the belly of the pork that has been rounded and it's been tied up and it's been let to cure for quite a bit of time. What we've done with this, we've taken a couple of slices and we've chopped them very fine. 
Very important for you to realize, if you don't have access to pancetta, because more often than not, is only available in Italian deli, the one thing that you want to do is you can basically use bacon, any kind of bacon, uh, even maple glazed bacon, if that's the, the flavor that you like. As you can see, our ingredients are starting to get nice and hot. Here's the moment in which we add the pancetta. Why do we add the pancetta? The fat of the pork, the presence, the flavor of the pancetta itself is right now building this block that gives this sauce a stance. A stance that ultimately will be mulled over by the other ingredients which are not secretive. Here is garlic, cut nice and thick. In the sauces, I don't like to add chopped garlic, especially if I'm going to cook it for a long period of time. I want the garlic itself to continue to cook without turning the sauce one way or the other. There is nothing more dangerous, more, nothing more difficult, nothing more disappointing when the garlic is used and unfortunately for us burns and it takes the sauce to a direction where we should not have gone. The next addition is an addition of wine. I, in this particular case, love the addition of Chardonnay wine. You can go with any wine you want, even Sauvignon Blanc. But whatever it is, I propose that you use a wine which is dry in character, so maybe nice and buttery with a round body, and this will do it for us. So a little bit. We want not to crank up the heat. You want to let this wine evaporate. When you make this at home, allow for this wine to just reduce by at least half of the amount that you've added. The next addition that we're going to make once the wine has evaporated is chicken stock. I always like chicken stock as this, my go-to stock. The reason why is because of all the various stocks that uh, you can have access to, it is the most gentle one. does not have a flavor that completely overtakes the flavoring of the sauce. Bring this to a boil. Once it reaches a boil, reduce it down to a simmer and let it simmer for, I would say, a good 45 minutes. And then we'll strain it. Once we strain it, we go from the looking of this to this other look right over here, and you can see how the sauce is now reduced, it's completely strained, and we'll finish it later on in the plating portion. One ingredient which is extremely important is what I'm holding right here in my hand. This is a bay leaf. Fresh bay leaf, if you have an access to it, make even a better sauce. Dry bay leaf is great. This is what you'll find at a regular supermarket. Add it into the sauce. As the sauce is simmering, it will open up, expand into another flavor. Let's deal with the shrimps. These guys are fantastic. By the way, somebody should write me. How do you go with the plural shrimp? Shrimp or shrimpes? I have no idea. Lived in this country for so long, I still make up my own words as I go along. Here we go. A little bit of paprika. I like what paprika does in terms of coloring the fish. Onion powder. Oh, yes. And a little bit of garlic powder as well. And then wildly, the next thing that we're going to do is put a little bit of salt. What I like to use is sea salt. People say, Nick, why are you so favorable towards sea salt? In my opinion, what sea salt does for us, it brings out a flavor that really is not aggressive. Has that ever happened to you, for example, you try some salt and you find that it's so aggressive, almost offensive? Sea salt has a smooth, round finish to it, something that truly brings everything into position. So here we go right now with our shrimp. I'm using extra light olive oil. The reason why I'm using extra light olive oil is because we're going to cook with very high heat. And if you were to use extra virgin olive oil on something that cooks with such high heat, it might actually cause for the oil to burn. Now let's take a look and see if the oil is ready. Here we go. We do not want to cook the shrimp all the way through. What we want to do with the shrimp, we simply want to cook it for just a couple of minutes until it changes the color. Until the flavorings that we put on it coat the outside of the shrimp. You can see the richness of what this has and how beautiful it is and how it's come into full motion. The shrimp is still raw on the inside and that's exactly where we want to have it because we want to finish the shrimp in the saute later on. Now, let's take the shrimp out of the pan. What I've done here, I have a little bowl with a strainer just so that the extra oil drips through, but I don't want to toss this oil that's in the pan right now. The reason why I don't want to do that is because this oil has the flavoring of all the spices that we use up to this point, the juices of the shrimp which have come out during the cooking, and we're going to use this as a continuous base for what we're about to make. So let's put the shrimp aside and let's get involved now with the making of the dish. So first and foremost we go with a little bit of our onions, nicely chopped. We want this sauté to move quickly. In this case it's important for the onions to be finely chopped because the finer they are the quicker they cook and look at it, they're going just exactly where we want it to go. A little bit more pancetta because I do like to have the chewing experience as I go into the shrimp 
together with the pancetta, which will have browned nicely at the end of the dish and bringing us a richness, a dynamic, flavoring dynamics, which we're truly seeking. Sun-dried tomatoes. What I'm adding is sun-dried tomatoes, which I've chopped. Let's spend a moment to discuss the sun-dried tomatoes. <laughs> These sun-dried tomatoes were packed in extra virgin olive oil, so we've taken them out. We had drained the tomatoes, we washed them quite well, now nice and soft, and then we chopped them up. If you buy sun-dried tomatoes out of a plastic bag, before you can use those tomatoes, don't make me laugh too hard, because once I had one of my friends say, oh, Nick, I buy them in a the plastic bag, I take them out, they look like chips, I toss them in there, they work perfect, they don't, it's a problem. If you take them out of the plastic bag, these are truly sun-dried tomatoes, but you have to revive them in hot water, then you have to let them step in hot water for about 30 minutes or so, then you can drain and pull them out, then you can chop them, then you can add them. But if you have access to sun-dried tomatoes packed in extra virgin olive oil, that is the direction where I want you to go. Garbanzo beans, right out of the can. We drain them real well, and we have washed them as well. You want to wash them because in the water in which the garbanzo beans are packed is an enormous amount of uh, salt. You do not want to have that excessive salt in there. A little bit more garlic into it so they can all cook together. Uno, due, tre, let's get this. Oh, look at this already. I'm composing a miraculous painting. Now we go with the shrimp that placed aside. We're going to finish the shrimp here in the saute pan. Guarda, guarda che bellezza. Uno più bello dell'altro, which means one more beautiful than the next. And then the unexpected has finally become the expected, and that is the addition of the arugula. As we add the arugula uncut, I want for this arugula to actually wilt into the saute. Not only will bring out color, but also will bring out a fantastic peppery flavor, which is so typical of the arugula in the serving of this dish. So I'm going to let this cook for a little while longer until the shrimp cooks all the way through. I'm going to finish up the sauce, and then I'm going to show you how to plate this. Very simple presentation. The shrimp has finished cooking. I'm turning it off. However, one thing that I love at this point and is the addition of softened butter. Look what happens once we add the softened butter. Just a tiny bit, that's all that you want. But it gives it a glaze. A glaze that sheens on top of the shrimp. And also, if you do it nice and light, as we're doing it right now, it makes it sparkle. Not just in the eyes, but makes it sparkle overall. The flavor is uh, a softened creaminess to it that brings you exactly to the direction you want to go to. We have our plate here ready. And this is the way I like to do it. Build it right on top of it. This is very country style. Don't stand there and spend too much time on where it goes, where it doesn't go. Make sure that all of the ingredients are present. A little big piece of shrimp right on top. A little bit more of the ingredients around it. Let it sing. This, this is something that has to sing for you. And then we go with the sauce. The sauce, what we've done with the sauce, remember we have strained the sauce once the sauce comes to the right consistency. And we reduce it a little bit more. If you find that the sauce needs even more thickening, be patient. Always finish the sauce first before you start with your presentation. So here we have shrimp, garbanzo beans, a little bit of sun dried tomatoes, arugula, and a chardonnay sauce. Signori e signori, ecco a voi il mio capolavoro. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is for you, my personal masterpiece. But then again, would you expect anything less? Shrimp. I love everything about shrimp. The most important thing about shrimp is not just the flesh itself is the shell. As a matter of fact, if I can give you a big word of advice, is when you shop for shrimp the next time that you do, make sure that you save the shells. What I like to do is to put them inside a plastic bag, put them in the freezer, and when I have enough, I make my own shrimp stock. You will love me for that alone. The other thing is how to handle shrimp, how to cook it. Depending on the size, the timing of the cooking varies, but the best way to go at it is with high heat, blasting it for a short period of time to really bring out the flavor into the shrimp before you cook it is to brush it with a little bit of oil and then spice it up with your own favorite uh, uh, flavor mix of uh, spices. Sugar, salt, pepper, yes, sugar, works wonders. Paprika, onion powder, garlic powder, so that when you finally cook it into the oven or under the broiler, immediately all this flavoring become almost a crust-like. Uh, on top of it, Many times you find yourself in need of small shrimp, but they're not available. And all that you can get is colossal shrimp. If that is the case, do not despair. Simply treat the shrimp as I told you, take the shell out, cut it in small pieces, and do whatever you need to do. 
Life is made of improvisation. It makes life a lot easier. Roasted shrimp with watermelon and goat cheese salad. An interesting story on how I came up with this recipe, and I'll share it with you in just a moment. But first, let's get cooking. Behind me, the oven is preheated at 500 degrees. Now, let's flavor the shrimp. The flavoring of the shrimp is, uh, I would say, a Nixtelino signature. I'm starting with onion powder. By the way, this type of onion powder is not the powdery one, it's the granulated one. In this particular case, if you can, I'm adding now uh, garlic powder. If you can find this, it's much better. The reason why I like it so much more is because once this shrimp roasts in the oven, assaulted by the 500 degrees uh, heat, one of the things that you'll come to love is that you find this little bits of flavoring given to you by these granulated forms of the spices almost to explode outward. Just imagine this as the shrimp is cooking, roasting inside the oven, the juices of the shrimp are coming out. They are embracing this tiny bit granules and as they do that, they are completely amalgamated into what I refer to something that would ultimately lead you into culinary submission. By the way, the last bit of red that you saw added to it, there was paprika. Since we are roasting in the oven with a very high heat, we have to be careful about the kind of oil that we place in our pan. I prefer a non-stick pan so that nothing sticks. In this case, what I'm using is extra light olive oil. Extra light olive oil has the ability to take very high heat, very high smoking point without burning. Very important for you to remember this. Extra virgin olive oil when cooking with such high heat might give us a problem in smoking inside the oven. Also, what I want you to do, be a bit organized in making sure that the shrimp is not standing on top of each other. I want them to touch the bottom of the pan so that they cook evenly inside the oven. Now, let's take a look at the watermelon. This watermelon is a beauty. Big slice, about two inches. Take a look at this. I mean, you can see how thick it is. How, how do we get our watermelon to look like tomato? Yeah, this is what's the idea that I got. I was thinking, hmm, look at the tomato salad, you know, the tomato and mozzarella salad that everybody does. Why couldn't I do it with watermelon? And then I thought, hmm, what are the ingredients? I open up the refrigerator, there it was, the goat cheese. And this is really how I was led on to it. What we have in here in my hand is a cookie cutter. Now, I'm going to use this cookie cutter to cut the shape that I want out of the watermelon. Watch how I do it. Very simple, you go straight into it and you cut it all the way through. Separate this away. Now, how do we get this piece out? You can do it with your bare hands, but I find that it's much safer by using an instrument like this wooden spoon and moving it, pushing down with a spoon and moving this up, you see? Very safe, very simple, but we are not done yet. We have to continue with what we need to do, and that is we need to cut it in rounds. Let me show you how to do it, very simple. Very sharp knife. I say about a quarter inch is where you want to go, and with a quarter inch you go attentively all the way through. You can make it as thick as you want to. But remember, you don't want to make it so super thick. You want to make it so that it's easy to cut through, easy to glide, and ultimately to create the towers that we want to do. Now, let's lay them all out here because I want to show you how I came up with another idea. Goat cheese. Goat cheese, it's a fantastic cheese. I love it. Creamy, has a nice saltiness to it. It has a presence that really enhances the flavor of everything, but very, very soft. So, what do you do with goat cheese? How do you use it in the context of this recipe in a way that's easy to go through and even assemble, especially if you're making it for a large number of people? We've taken the goat cheese out of the plastic wrapping, and usually the goat cheese that you find in your local supermarket is shaped to look like a log. It's been taken out, we place it on a plate like this, and before we cut it, we put it into the freezer, not to freeze it, but to chill it to a hard-like condition. Then it's a lot easier for us to cut the rounds. Now watch, because it's another little trick that you're going to love. You see these rounds right here? These are the rounds that I have laid out. And if you see the visual where I'm going with this, you'll understand what the next step is. Right next to the rounds, I am placing now the rounds of the watermelon. If you don't know that this is watermelon, by the way, the first time I, I published it in a post that I did, people thought that it was tomato. Here we have a smaller cookie cutter. <laughs> you say, why? This cookie cutter almost matches the same roundness of the goat cheese, and you'll see how lovely this is. So what I do is I choose the best slices of uh, the uh, watermelon that I have, and I basically cut it into smaller rounds again. Watch this here, here as well. What you notice is that at this point it's so thin that just by pulling it away with my finger I can do it. You want to have a total of three. That's all that you need. You don't need any more than that. No, I don't like this slice. I like this one instead. So here you go and it comes out. 
we have here all the elements for the making of our salad. We have two slices of the goat cheese, three slices of the watermelon. The last thing that we need to do is we need to put this shrimp into the oven. Preheated at 500 degrees, we're gonna let it cook for about four minutes on one side. We're gonna turn it on the other side, give it another three minutes at most, and then bring it right out. And I'm gonna show you exactly how to plate this wonderful salad. Still hot. Got this out of the oven, still sizzling here where we have a little addition that you're going to love. If you do this in Italy, they kill you. I mean it, they absolutely kill you. There is no Italian chef who would ever recognize legally what I'm doing as a good thing. What we're just doing, we're grating some fresh Parmesan cheese on top of the shrimp. Shellfish and Parmesan cheese is illegal in Italy. However, we're not in Italy, I love it, and this is how I roll. So, the next thing that we do, gonna put this on the side, and the Parmesan cheese will create a nice, wonderful glaze on top of the shrimp. Let's assemble the salad. We have our ingredient. First and foremost, right here, we have our watermelon. So I put a piece of watermelon down. Bring close to me the goat cheese. Here we go with a little piece of goat cheese. Another piece of watermelon right on top of it. Another piece of goat cheese right on top of it. And lastly, we close it with a piece of watermelon. So here we have our watermelon salad. Looks very much like tomatoes. And you would not be wrong. Here what I have in my hand is some leaves of arugula. What I'm gonna do with this arugula is just to bathe a tiny, tiny couple of drops of extra virgin olive oil. And I'll show you what I mean. Just no more than, uh, there you are, that's enough. Too much almost. So I'm gonna do this with the arugula light. I'm gonna place it right on over here. Watch this, this is important. I have balsamic vinegar in here, dark balsamic vinegar. I'm gonna place it in here just because I wanna use it and I will show you exactly what I want to do and I wanna have the dexterity and the ability of mixing it together. Now, before we get going with anything else, we choose a little shrimp, we place it right on top of it. Just because I'm all Mr. Fancy Schmancy, I put a couple of the arugula leaves on top because it gives me such pleasure. A little piece of shrimp on top of that too, let's make it two. And we decorate the whole thing with a bit of extra virgin olive oil that goes all the way around, just like this, and use the best quality extra virgin olive oil that you can. And then, do you remember the vinegar that I told you before? Here it goes. I want to do just a couple of drops in there. You don't need any more of this flavoring because this by itself is fantastic. Signori e signori, roasted shrimp with watermelon and goat cheese salad. I love this. And there it is. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the recipes that we made together. Shrimp with garbanzo beans, arugula, sun-dried tomatoes, and a chardonnay sauce. And then this wonderful salad with roasted shrimp, goat cheese, watermelon, and even a little bit of arugula. These are very simple recipes, yet very elegant and very powerful. I hope that you will share it with your family and with your friends. And my wish is that you will turn your home into your favorite restaurant. Until next time, ciao a tutti. I wanted to discover something new about rucola, and I decided to get connected with one of the experts. Ray, how are you doing? Good nice morning. Nice to see you, always a pleasure. I want to share with the viewers something unique about rucola. Why don't you tell me, what are these two different types of rucola that you grow? This is a rucola roquette. Roquette, a bit, uh, like a rocket. Like a rocket. Yeah. It's a, a baby variety. We eat it with it all. This is a rugula selvatica, which is a wild variety. Selvatica. This I had done before. This is very spicy, very peppery. Very spicy, very peppery. This is too, but it's softer pepper. Now, you have a 10 by 4 bed in here. I see that you've got several others. How difficult is to actually manage? It's very easy. Very easy. Yes, you sir. let that go to flower, I see. Yes, I let this go to flower. This just seeds itself across the garden and comes up wild. And wild. this one instead? The this roquette? one and I sow seed. One of the things I want to share with you is that if you have the opportunity, if you have the right sight uh, and the exposure to the sun, you should start some of this gardening. This is very easy to grow. It tastes fantastic. And in no time at all, you can develop the passion that this man has. Thank you so much. Mm, I'm taking welcome. some of this home. <laughs> I want some of that. I want some of that.